All right, so today we are actually, let's first go over the practice test before we, we move on. And in the practice test, you can see there are three questions, each worth 20 points. The first question says, two rigid rods are oriented parallel to each other and to the ground. The rod carry the same current in the same direction. The length of each rod is 0.85 meters, while the mass of each one is 0.073 kg. One rod is held in place above the ground and the other floats beneath it at a distance of 8.2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Determine the current in the rods. This is problem one. So you have two rods like this and it's saying that the rods are parallel to each other and to the ground and they carry the current in the same direction. So, and the, they're carrying the same current, let's call it I. Okay, and, and you are given that the distance between the two, D, is 8.2 times 10 power minus 3 meters. This is the distance here between these two rods. Um, while the mass of each, mass of each rod is given to us to be 0 0.073 kg. Uh, the question says, if suppose the other one, which is uh, the one at the bottom, is somehow just floating. This one is attached to something, maybe it's attached to a rope or something, but the bottom one doesn't even need any rope, it's just floating. Why do you think it will float? If it just floats and it's in equilibrium, what does it mean from Newton's second law? That the net force on it is zero, right? Isn't that true? If there's no acceleration or anything, that means the net force on this rod is zero. Why would the net force be zero? We have, let's draw a free body diagram of that rope to make sure we understand why the net force is zero. Which force on this thing is acting down? Gravitational force, you have the weight, mg. What do you think, shouldn't there be a force in the upward direction on it to balance this? What do you think it is? Same direction, they attract each other via magnetic force. Do you remember that? So yes, there is a force in the upward direction that's attracting it attracting it to this rod and that is the magnetic force. Why is the magnetic force acting upward? Because these wires are carrying current in the same direction. Do you remember? Basically the idea is that this wire will produce a magnetic field at the location of this wire, right? And if you do it, look, the, the, this wire is producing a magnetic field at the location of this wire that is across. If I use my right hand rule, put my thumb in the direction of current here, do you see the magnetic field at this point? Due to this wire, let's call it wire 1, wire 2, if you like, B2 is across here. And if B2 is across, then remember the force on wire 2, F2, would be I L cross B. Right? And if this was L cross B, let's do L cross B and see which way L is in the direction of current. B is the crosses that is produced by this wire. Do you see my thumb is pointing up? And that is this force, F of B. This is this force. F of B is really this, this one that we are talking about. If you want, we can call it F to B. And notice that I'm not worrying about the force on this wire. It's true that this wire will be attracted towards this, but it's being held by some rope or something so that it doesn't get plumped, you know, doesn't fall into this one. Okay, so the thing is, what is this force? Let's first find this force because one thing that we do know from Newton's second law here is that net force, if we call this thing the y direction, then the net force in the y direction should be zero, the vector sum of all the forces. That means that the F to B magnitude, which is in the positive y direction minus mg should be equal to zero and that means that F to B magnitude should be equal to mg. Right? Okay, so if that's the case, then we need to figure out what is the magnitude of F to B in terms of things that we know. All right? So how do we figure this out? We are given here, oh, by the way, the length of each rod is given also. L, if you look at the problem, it says that the length of each rod is uh, 0.85 meters. So L is given. By the way, let's find the magnitude of this. If we find the magnitude of this, this will be I L B times sine theta. Sine is the angle between L and B. And if you can see, L is like this. B is into the board. The angle between them is 90. So this is sine 90, which is 1 
990 is 1, so that goes away. So all we have is ILB. What is this B? B is really the magnetic field that is produced by wire 1. If you like, maybe it's clearer if I say call it B1. That means this is the magnetic field at the location of wire 2 which is produced by wire B, wire 1. What is the magnetic field produced by wire 1? Do you remember? If the wire is long, straight, carrying current, the magnetic field produced by it at a distance r away is mu 0 times i divided by 2 pi r. Remember that? This is nothing. This F2B then is nothing but I L and B1 will be mu 0 times I divided by 2 pi times the distance between the two wires which is D here and sine 90 is 1 anyway. So let's plug this here and solve. So what we have then is F sub B is equal to mg or I times I will make it I square, I square times L times mu 0 divided by 2 pi D is equal to mg. <clears throat> Everything is positive right now. Uh, I and the question is asking for the current. We are solving for current. So you can see from here I square is 2 pi D mg divided by L times mu 0. So I will be square root of this. I'm not going to so I put the numbers. You know the value of B is given, M is given, G is the acceleration due to gravity, right? The magnitude of acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second square. Mu zero is a constant, 4 pi times 10 per minus 7 tesla meter per amperes. L is given to us. Everything is known. The everything is an SI, if everything is an SI unit, the current should turn out to be in which unit? Amperes. Very good. Any questions, folks? All right, let's look at the second question. It says, a 500 turn rectangular loop of wire has an area of 0 0.005 meters square at time t equal to 0. The magnetic field is turned on and the magnitude increases to 0 0.05 tesla when t is equal to 0.9 seconds. The field is directed at an angle phi, which is 30 degrees with respect to the normal to the loop. Find the magnitude of the average EMF induced in the loop. So basically in this problem, we are, what should we make use of here? Huh? Should we be making use of Faraday's law here? Isn't this problem related to Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction? Because the magnetic flux through the loop is changing, right? Your magnetic field was zero at time t equal to zero, and then suddenly you turned on a magnetic field. So there is a change in the magnetic flux. There is a change in the total number of magnetic field lines that are passing through the loop, right? Will there be an induced EMF and an induced current through the loop then? There will be. And what you're being asked here is determine the induced EMF, magnitude of the induced EMF. So in this case, we will make use of this one, EMF induced should be equal to minus N d phi over dt. And, and we don't really care about the minus sign, so we will just worry about the induced EMF's magnitude because that's what we have been asked for. And this is just N, uh, N times de delta phi. And let's not worry about uh, keeping it as a derivative, let's find it at two discrete times because this is going to be pretty accurate. We have been given that the magnetic field at time t equal to 0 is 0 and at time t equal to 0.9 seconds is 0 .5, 0 0.05 tesla. So let's figure out what we have been given. We need to find V induced, the magnitude of V induced. We are given that the number of turns of coil is 500 turns. We have been given that at time t equal to 0, initial time, the magnetic field B0 is 0. And we are given that at some final time, 0.9 seconds, the magnetic field is 0 0.05 Tesla. We are also told 
that the field is directed at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the normal to the loop. So the thing is if suppose this is the loop here, this paper is the loop let's say, uh, this was blank let's say there was nothing here and it was just a wire here. Then in that case if this is just a wire, what the normal to this wire is making an angle 30 degrees. Is that the cosine theta that comes in the flux? It does right because the normal to this wire is the area vector is the direction of the area vector and that is making an angle of 30 degrees with the magnetic field. The magnetic field is pointing at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the area vector right. So we know that phi final is equal to 30 degrees. You know let us call that I, I do not like the name phi for the angle let us call it theta. Why do I want to call it theta because I do not want you to get confused between the symbol for flux because we keep calling flux phi. If we start calling angle phi also you would not know whether I am talking about the angle or whether I am talking about the flux. So let us call it theta change it in your problem just call it theta it is much easier. So what is phi of b? Phi of b is in our case since the magnetic field is constant it is magnitude of b times magnitude of a times cosine theta where theta is the angle between area vector and b. So b induced for us has a magnitude which is n times delta phi over delta t which means phi final minus phi initial divided by t final minus t initial. right and so basically v induced then is going to be n times phi final is given to us it is b final times the area times cosine uh, 30 degrees minus phi 0 is 0 right phi 0 is 0 does everybody agree with me because the initial magnetic field is 0 b 0 is 0 that means phi 0 is 0 divided by you know t final minus again initial time is 0 also. So basically then all you have to do at this point is just plug in the values you know you are given n you are given oh by the way have we been given the area oh yes we have been given the area of the loop I forgot to write it up there please write it down. So we have been given that the area of cross section of the loop it has a magnitude of 0 0.005 meter square and we already said that the area vector is making an angle theta which is 30 degrees with respect to the magnetic field in the final at the final time that means 0 0.09 seconds after the field is turned on. So all we have to do is solve for v induced does that make sense what would be your final answer if everything is an SI unit huh right final answer should be in volts if magnetic field is in tesla area is in meter square you know uh, time is in seconds etc. Any questions folks anybody okay let us look at the next question it says the drawing shows two perpendicular wires that lie in the plane of the paper each wire carries a current of 5.6 amperes determine the magnitude and direction of the net magnetic field at points A and B. So basically in this question. Okay, so in the third question you are shown two wires that are perpendicular to each other you know very close to each other but one on top of each other extremely close like this right on top and the thing is one of them is carrying current like this and the other thing is carrying current like this and you have some point OA over here which is at a distance let us call this wire 1 and let us call this wire 2. So this is at a distance D1 d1 a is 0.2 meters and we are given that 
this distance which we can call d 2 a d 2 sub a is 0.4 meter and then we have another point over here somewhere point b and it turns out that the distance of point b from wire 1 this is this we can called d 1 b this is given to us to be again 0.2 meter and d 2 b is given to us to be 0.4 meter. The question is asking for the net magnetic field here and the net magnetic field here. Again the only thing that you really have to work on here is to find the direction of the magnetic field right. So let us can we because all that we have to do let us do it one by one. So case 1 will be point A. One thing we have to first do is let us fi figure out the direction of magnetic field. What would be the direction of magnetic field due to the current in this wire at this location? Do you see if I put my thumb in the direction of current, do you see my fingers in the right hand go into the board? In your case it will go into your paper. So basically then the magnetic field due to wire 2 which we can call B2 is across at this location, right? What about B1? So put, put your thumb in the direction of current you can see that the magnetic field on this side of the wire one is going in but here at the location of point A it is coming out. So is everybody agreeing that the magnetic field B1 is coming out? So B1 is a dot here and B2 is a cross here. You know let us choose one of those to be positive let us say that dot means out this is the positive. positive direction it does not really matter if this is what I choose to be my positive direction B net at point A will be what B1 is positive because it is a dot which I chose to be positive minus B2 because that is a cross and so what is this this will be mu 0 is the current the same in both wires yeah both of them are carrying current of 5.6 amperes so current in each of these wires is the same and I is given to us to be 5.6 amperes. So this will be mu 0 times I divided by 2 pi times this distance D 1 A and then B 2 will be mu 0 times I divided by 2 pi times D 2 A. And I am not going to plug in the numbers you know the values of mu 0 I is the same which is 5.6 amperes in each case D 1 A is given to us to be 0.2 meters D 2 A is given to be 0.4 meters is this number going to be positive or negative tell me. It will be positive because of the fact that D 1 A is less you know if, if something in the denominator is less that means numerator is overall is going to be big. Do you see what I am saying? This is really nothing but mu 0 i divided by 2 pi 1 over d 1 a minus 1 over d 2 a and you can see this is positive. If this number is positive that means the net magnetic field is coming out because do, do you understand what I am saying? Because I chose positive direction to be out and this is positive that means this must be the net magnetic field at this point is coming out. Why? It makes sense actually right because this point is closer to this wire and so that is having a larger effect than the, this wire and hence this thing is bigger than this and hence this net turns out to be positive right. That means net magnetic field is coming out at you. Any questions about this folks? Okay what about at this point? We can do things exactly in the same manner again wh which way is the magnetic field due to wire 1 do you see if I put my thumb in the direction of current wire 1 has a magnetic field going in. So if you like at this point B, B1 is across what about B2 see put my thumb in the direction of current you can see that way that side of the wire the magnetic field is going in this side it is coming out so here B2 is a dot. right so again B net at B at point B this is point B will be equal to B2 minus B1 
why do I do B2 minus B1? Because B2 is the one that is coming out at us and we chose out to be the positive direction. So if that's the case, this will be equal to mu0 i divided by 2 pi d2b minus mu0 i divided by 2 pi d1b. That's it. And at this point, is this positive or negative? Huh? This thing is negative because you can see that d2b, which is a larger number, 0 .04, 0 0.4 meter, is the first thing, is the positive thing in the denominator. And here we have 0.2 meter in the denominator. So this thing is negative. If this is negative, means this means points which way? Into the board, right? Yeah. In your case, into the paper, that means it's across. And here, this is positive, which means it's a dot coming out at you. Because direction is very important for a vector. You cannot just say magnitude and leave it. You have to say which direction something is pointing if it's a vector, and this is a magnetic field. Any questions about this, folks? OK, let's go over the multiple choice questions then. And some of these you have seen before. One of them says, current is going around a circle in a counterclockwise direction, produces a magnetic field whose direction at the center of the circle is which way? So you have something, and the current is going this way. You can use your right hand rule, right? This is the right hand thumb rule for finding the current. Remember, there are two right hand rules, and you should never get confused. One is the right hand rule that you have always known ever since you were in high school. Even before you came to college, you should have known the right hand screw rule, right? Which is for cross product, which says put your fingers in the direction of one vector, cross it in the direction of the second vector. Your thumb will point in the direction in which the third vector points. That's also the direction of the screw in which the screw will move. That's the one that you have always known. That is the one that you use, for example, to find the force. You know, F is equal to I L cross B, or F is equal to Q V cross B, right? Put your fingers in the direction of the first, cross it in the second, thumb points in the direction of the screw or the third vector, right? OK, but the second right hand rule that we have learned is for the direction of magnetic field. This is the second rule or the thumb rule for finding magnetic field. And that says that put your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers will curl around in the direction of magnetic field, right? So here, if I put my thumb in the direction of current, you can see the magnetic field on this side is in, here it's out. Of course, in this case, I have to find the vector sum of the magnetic field due to all of these. But can everybody be convinced that if I put my thumb here at the center of this loop, the magnetic field due to all of these current segments, little DLs here, it's all pointing out? Isn't that true? OK, so the magnetic field here will be coming out at us. The correct answer is B, out of the page. You know, sometimes books also tell you an easy way to figure out the direction of magnetic field is at the center is to put your, all of your fingers in the direction of current and your thumb will be in the direction of magnetic field. If you find it confusing, don't worry. Just use the one that I have taught you all the time. That will work, serve you well. All right, let's look at the next one. It says, the force on a charged particle is, the magnetic force on a charged particle is in the direction of velocity. The answer should be? Never, right? Why is the magnetic force never in the direction of velocity? Any, anybody? Remember, the magnetic force is Q V cross B. So if a charged particle is moving in a magnetic field, the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity, and the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the B external. So magnetic force can never be in the direction of velocity. It's always perpendicular to it. Does that make sense? Okay. In fact, if the charged particle was moving parallel to the magnetic field, it will be completely oblivious of the presence of magnetic field, right? It will feel no force at all, no magnetic force, right? An electron enters a region of uniform perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. It's observed that the velocity of the electron is unaffected. A possible explanation is 
What do you think? Huh? Yeah, the correct answer is D. Because remember, this was the principle we used for velocity selectors. What we said, what we said is that suppose you have a parallel plate capacitor that is producing a uniform electric field from positive plate to the negative plate. So this is the direction of the electric field, right? And suppose you launch some electron. You launch some electron, which is a negatively charged particle, into this field. Remember, the electric force on it will be what? Would the electric force be Q times E? Yeah. And so the thing is, electric force on a positive charge will be in the direction of electric field, but electric force on the electron will be opposite to that. So the electron will feel a force that way. F of E on the electron is pointing that way. Now if you put a magnetic field also in addition to the electric field, this is like your, your exploration problem. Did you do an exploration problem just like this? Yeah. So if you put a magnetic field also, now look at this. You know, there is a magnetic force on the electron, F of B, which is Q V cross B. And which way is it? V cross B on a positive charge, it's up. But since the electron has a negative sign here, magnetic force is down. So F of B is down. And at the moment, these two forces cancel out. The electron will just go undeflected, right? It will be undeflected if this is true. If F of E has the same magnitude as F of B, so you can see if Q times E has the same magnitude as Q times V, B times sine 90. Sine 90 is 1 anyway, so Q and Q get cancelled. And so you can see that if V, if the electric field which is perpendicular to the magnetic field and have this ratio, V is equal to E divided by B, then there is no net force on the electron and it is going to go undeviated. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, let's look at the next question. It says two conducting loops carry current I in the same direction as shown in the figure. If the current in the upper loop suddenly goes to zero, what will happen to the current in the bottom loop according to Lenz's law? So basically, this is the situation. You have two loops on top of each other. So here are the two loops. Okay, this is carrying current in this direction, let's say, and this is also carrying current in the same direction. They're both on top of each other, right? Are there magnetic flux? Are the magnetic flux? Uh, are the magnetic flux in both of these loops due to currents in each of these loops in the same direction? It is right because let's think about it. The magnetic, if suppose this wire is carrying current this way. You know, if I put my thumb in the direction of current, do you see magnetic field is going like this up due to the current? Any, any, look at it any direction, isn't it? So the magnetic field lines due to this current is going from bottom to top. If this wire is also carrying current in the same direction, the magnetic, you know, flux due to it is also in, you know, the same way. So the magnetic field lines are basically going in the same direction. So if I now put both of them on top of each other, are the magnetic field lines due to each of them reinforcing each other? They are. Now if I suddenly drop the current on one, in one of them to zero, let's say the current in this one went to zero, is the magnetic flux through both of the loops decreasing now? Yes, it is decreasing. But the, according to Lenz's law, these coils will oppose it. They will try to maintain a status quo. They'll try to you know, replenish what you have lost and so what will happen to the induced current in one of them? Suppose is the top one the current is going to zero? Okay. So in the top one, due to self-inductance, the coil will try to replenish what it's lost, right? So it'll induce a current in it. In the other coil, due to mutual inductance, the coil will induce a current through it. It's the same idea basically. But do you see that in both of them there'll be an induced current? Because both of them see a flux changing through them. One of them see, sees a flux changing through it because the current in the same coil has gone to zero, is dropping to zero, is, is being decreased. This one sees because it was actually sitting next to it and it, was, it, it saw the flux passing through it because of this wire also and now you are suddenly reducing the current through this. So this wire will also have a 
induced current in it. Will the induced current should be in the same direction in which the current was initially with which you got rid of? Yes, because you are trying to replenish what you got rid of. The coil tries to replenish what it got rid of. So, the induced current due to the self induction in the same coil will also be in the same direction. The induced current in the other coil due to the mutual inductance will also be in this coil. So, in this, in this coil for example, now you will see a larger current compared to what you had initially because there will be an extra current for the period of time that you make this change. So, for the period of time the current in this one is decreasing, you will see an increased current in this because this coil is trying to replenish what you got rid of here. Similarly, in this coil also the current will suddenly not drop to 0. All of a sudden we have seen the current goes to 0 over a period of time, you know, depending upon what is the self inductance of this coil. Is that making sense, <laughs> folks? So, what was the correct answer then? The correct answer is it will increase. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay. Let us look at the next one. It says there are two solenoids which are ideal, that means they are very closely wound and they are infinitely long. Solenoid B has twice the radius and six times the number of turns per unit length as solenoid A. Ratio of magnetic field in the interior of solenoid B to that of solenoid A is what? What do you think? Any <laughs> questions, folks? Go ahead. Anybody? Remember for a solenoid the magnetic field produced by it if it is an ideal solenoid which is infinitely long is B is equal to mu 0 I n right and it is parallel to the axis whether it is pointing one way or the other depends upon whether the current is flowing this way or that way but it is definitely parallel to the axis everywhere inside if it is an ideal long solenoid. So in that case if it is B is equal to mu 0 n i does the magnetic field depend upon the radius? No, for an ideal solenoid which is very tightly wound and which is infinitely long, the radius is completely unimportant, right? So, B of a solenoid has a magnitude which is mu 0 i times number of turns per unit length. And so, in this particular case, the ratio of magnetic field B sub B divided by B sub solenoid A will be equal to mu 0 i sub b n sub b divided by mu 0 i sub a n sub a. What you are told is that uh, the, the, these, the only thing they, they, are, they have the same current through them. The only thing that is different here is the ratio of the n's and so you can see that the answer should only depend upon that ratio and that turns out to be 6. right? Radius does not matter. Any questions about this? So, the magnetic field inside the sol an ideal solenoid only depends upon the number of turns per unit length and the current that is it. Do you guys have any questions? All right, let us look at the next question. It says the statement that magnetic field lines form closed loops is a direct consequence of, okay, this one Actually, I think I gave by mistake because the thing is this is something that you have not really done, but let us do it anyway. So, uh, basically remember we said that in magnetism what, what happens? Uh, we are not going to dwell on this idea very much, but remember we said that in magnetism what happens is that magnetic field lines go out of the north pole towards south pole and they keep going, going, going till they actually merge. So, so in other words magnetic field lines form closed loops. What happens if I keep cutting the magnet into smaller and smaller pieces? Will each of them turn into little magnets such that it has north and south poles so that the magnetic field lines still keep forming closed loops? They do, right? And this idea that you cannot have isolated north and south pole, that means even to the level of a single electron, you actually have a di magnetic dipole. You have something that, you know, magnetic field lines will always clo form closed loops is given by this idea is given by what is called Gauss's law of magnetism. So, what does Gauss's law of magnetism say? Gauss's law of magnetism basically says this. It says that integral 
over a clo any closed area of B dot DA should be equal to, do you know what it should be equal to? Look at this picture, you know, what is the meaning, I mean, over any closed area B dot DA, B dot DA is what? That is what we call the, you have seen that thing over and over again, that is the magnetic flux, is not that the magnetic flux? The magnetic flux over a closed loop is always going to be what? <coughs> See, if you can never have an isolated north pole or an isolated south pole, how much should be the magnetic flux through any closed loop? No matter how small you make that, uh, sorry, over a closed area, no matter how small that area becomes, it should be 0. Because remember, the, in Gauss's law of electricity, the electric flux integral E dot dA was always Q enclosed divided by epsilon 0, right? But if inside that area you enclosed equal amount of positive and negative charges, then the electric flux would be 0, wouldn't it? Here the point is you cannot, you cannot ever enclose just a north pole inside a closed surface or you cannot just have a south pole inside a closed surface. Magnetic field lines always form closed loop. You have to have as many north poles as south poles inside of a loop always and so integral b dot dA should always be equal to 0. There is never any north pole enclosed divided by epsilon 0 or south pole enclosed divided by epsilon 0 because you cannot just enclose south pole or north pole inside a loop, closed, uh, inside a closed area. You will always enclose as many south poles as north poles because magnetic field lines always form closed loops. You, can, you, have, you never have isolated north only or south only even to the level of electron. Electron itself has a north and a south. So basically the correct answer here is Gauss's law of magnetism which says integral b dot dA is equal to 0. Magnetic field lines will always form closed loops. There is no isolated north or south pole. All right, let's look at the next question. It says four long straight wires carry equal currents as shown. The, field, the force exerted on wire A is in which direction? What do you think, folks? Which direction is it? East? Yeah, the correct answer is east. Why is east the correct answer? Because if you look at it, you know, you have one wire like this. This is the wire A on which I have to find the force. So if I have to find the force on wire A, let's draw a free body diagram of wire A only, right? We, that's what we'll focus on. Which way is wire A feeling a force due to that wire? Towards it, right? Because wires carrying current in the same direction, both of these are carrying current into the board or into the paper. So this wire will be attracted towards that. Let us call it 1, 2, 3. F1 is pointing that way. What about the force on wire 1 due to 2? Is it like this? Yeah, because wire A and wire 2 are also carrying current in the same direction. The two of them attract each other, so wire A is attracted towards it. I am only inter interested in the free body diagram, in other words, the forces on wire A. So I am drawing it towards wire 2, showing that it is being attracted, right? What about wire A, force on wire A due to wire 3? Again, it is an attraction, so wire A is feeling a force at 3 like this. Does everybody see that if I choose this to be my x direction and this to be my y direction? If I resolve F1 into X and Y components and if I resolve F2 into X and Y components, does everybody agree that the Y component of F1 and F2 get cancelled because the magnitude of F1 and magnitude of F2 are the same? Why do I know that? Because wire 1 and wire 2 are carrying exactly equal amount of current and they are at the same distance from wire A. So F1 must be equal to F2 two in magnitude, right folks? So if the vertical components cancel out, then do you see that only the horizontal components survive and so the net force in, is in that direction. That's what we are calling east. Any questions? Okay, let's look at the next one. It says, two long parallel straight wires carry equal current in opposite directions. The force that each wire exerts on the other one is? Yeah, if they are carrying current in the opposite direction, they repel. Do you remember? Yeah. Because wires carrying current in the same direction attract, we have seen that. 
and carrying current in the opposite direction repel. If you are not convinced, try to convince yourself by first finding what is the magnetic field produced by one wire at the location of the other wire, then use F is equal to I L cross V to check what is the direction using your right hand rule and you will see wires carrying current in opposite directions repel. All right, folks, so at this point I actually wanted to start, I wanted to start here by showing you a model of a transformer, okay. So here is the input voltage and here is the output voltage. Right now the number of turns of on both sides, so here is the model of a transformer, okay. This is the iron core, you know, along which these two coils, this is the input wire, this is the output coil, okay, this is the, you can also call it primary coil, you can also call it the secondary coil. If the number of turns are the same on both primary and secondary side, what should be the input voltage compared to the output voltage? Should they be the same? Yeah, and in fact you can pretty much see, I mean, in reality you cannot ignore the resistance of the windings and things themselves, so things are not ideal. So you see slight difference, but it's roughly the same. Both of them are roughly 40 volts, right? Now, what do you expect will happen if I actually disconnect, suppose I disconnect uh, that side, this thing, and I put instead a thousand, a thousand uh, turns, a coil with a thousand turns. Can anybody say what will happen to this output voltage compared to the input one? <coughs> Any thoughts folks? Make a guess and then I'm going to also ask you what happens if I put 120 turns on the output side. In which case what will happen? Everybody should be talking to a person next to them and thinking about what will happen in the two situations. Okay, somebody from the front row, what should happen in this case, you know, input voltage will always be showing, you know, whatever value you saw earlier, what should happen to the output voltage now? If I put, it made this 1000 turns and this stays 500 turns, anybody? Do, do you remember, like, is this called a step up or step down transformer? Yeah, this is a step up because you know it's trying. It will step up the output voltage compared to the input voltage. If you remember, what we learned is this. What we learned is that the transformer equation says that the voltage in the primary divided by voltage in the secondary should be equal to the number of turns in the primary divided by number of turns in the secondary. Right? From here, you can see that if Ns is greater than Np, that means Vs will be greater than Vp, right? And this is what's called a step up transformer. It steps up the voltage in the secondary. This is a step up transformer. Right? Doesn't that make sense? So tell me what will happen on the output side, anybody? Huh? Go ahead, before I do it, tell me. The voltage will be higher on the secondary, but do you know exactly how much higher? If there was no, you know, if, if this was an ideal system, in this case, we are making the number of turns of the primary. You can see here that <coughs> Ns divided by Np will be Vs divided by Vp, right? So if this is 1000 turns and this is 500 turns, do you see that this ratio will be 2? And that's what you will see in ideal case. In ideal case, if this one is 40 volts, that one will be 80 volts if the number of turns is twice as large, right? Okay, what, what, what about the step down transformer? If I make this thing 250 volts, what do you think will happen? Tell me, what should you see here roughly? Huh? Decrease by how much? How much should it decrease to if this is only 250 turns as opposed to 500 for the prim uh, primary? 
Tell me, folks. Very good. It will be around 20 volts. And you can see it's around 20 volts, right? Because in this case, the secondary number of coils is half the number of coils in the primary. And so this is a step down transformer, which is stepping down the voltage to half the value of the primary. So whatever you put on the primary, the secondary will be half. Of course, in this case, we are making several assumptions when we say that it's exactly the same. And you see it's not exactly the same, because we are ignoring the resistance. Not only that, we are also assuming that all of the flux, you know, if there's current changing with time, because the current is alternating here, if the current is changing in time, all of the magnetic field associated with that current channels through this iron winding and goes to the secondary. So the secondary gets all of the magnetic field lines of the primary. But you know, this channeling is never perfect. And that's why you see that this is not exactly half. But to a good approximation, what we are saying is pretty good. And the, most of the magnetic field lines will channel through this iron core to the secondary so that this mutual induction phenomena is pretty you know, good, and we can assume that all the flux magnetic field lines that are passing through the primary are also going through the secondary. Does that make sense? Any questions about this, folks? OK, then let's now get back to what we were talking about last time. We were also talking about LC circuits, right? Was there something very special about LC circuits compared to any circuit that you have seen in the past? Because we have seen circuits just with resistances, just with capacitances, with R and L, LR circuits. Those circuits didn't show something very special that this circuit shows. Go ahead. Very good. This circuit was somehow showing that the current was actually behaving like a sine curve or a cosine curve. You know, it was sinusoidal. The word sinusoidal means it's a sine or a cosine curve. There's not much difference between a sine and a cosine. It's just a difference of phase. You know, if you move the sine by 90 degrees, it becomes a cos, it looks like a cosine, right? So the point is in this case, what we saw is that the current half the time was going one way and half the time the other way. It was like this. And that's what you call sinusoidal. So if we plotted current as a function of time, it'll go like this. As opposed to, for example, in the case of uh, just circuits with resistances in which the current was constant, in circuits with capacitances where current, you know, went exponentially if we had R and C, RC circuits, exponential decrease or exponential increase, etc. RL circuits, again, it was exponential. Here, the current is going sinusoidally. Do you remember that? And let me remind you just the basic uh, physics of it conceptually before we do the math for this. So what we said, for example, is that let's say that the circuit, uh, you know, we had capacitor fully charged. This is the inductor with inductance L. This is the capacitor with capacitance C. And at time t equal to 0, we close the switch. As soon as we close the switch, this capacitor starts acting like a battery, right? These electrons now have a path through this wire, a conduction, conducting path to move in this direction. In other words, we can say that a current is flowing in this direction. As the current starts to flow, what happens? This, this thing, so as the current starts to flow, this capacitor gets discharged, right? Because the negative charges are combining with the positive. After some time, the capacitor has very little charges left. And in fact, finally, the, all the charges are gone. At this point, the capacitor cannot act like a battery in, anymore. It's like a discharge battery. It's acting like a discharge battery. So would the current stop at this point? No, the current doesn't stop because of the fact that the inductor According to Faraday's law and Lenz's law, it tries to maintain a status quo. So when it sees that the capacitor has given up and the current is going to zero, it induces an EMF because it has magnetic energy stored in it because of this current. It uses its magnetic energy and induces a current to, to replenish the current that is being lost. And so the current continues, this time due to the effort of the inductor. It's inducing this current because of Faraday's law and Lenz's law. So the thing is, so this, this induced uh, current now, what will this induced current do? This induced current now, actually, look what it does. You know, if the current is, uh, if this inductor maintains the status quo and continues to send current in this direction, now if the current is this way, that means the electrons are moving this way, that means this plate of the capacitor starts becoming negatively charged. The electrons are le leaving this plate, so it becomes positively charged. Because if the current is flowing this way, electrons are moving this way. 
And after some time, this plate becomes completely charged with negative and this one with positive, the same amount of charge that you had initially. But at this point, the inductor has given up. It gets used to not having a current through it. So it says, OK, fine, I'm OK. I give up. But at this point, even though the inductor gives up, what has happened to the capacitor? It has become charged. So it can now take over and start behaving like a battery again. And this time, since the polarity has changed, this plate is neg positive and this plate is, neg is negative, as opposed to this plate being positive and this plate being negative initially, this time, the electrons will flow this way due to the capacitive charge. And this, that means the current will flow this way. And that's what you're seeing. This, this current is due to the discharging of the capacitor. Due to this current, again, the capacitor gets discharged. You can see, and there's a point when the capacitor is fully discharged, the current has become maximum. Now there's maximum magnetic energy stored in the inductor, that is half Li square. Remember the energy stored in the capacitor was half Cv square, or another way to say it, it'll, it is half Q square over C. You can write it in terms of the potential difference across the plates or the charge on each plate. So half Q square over C is the same as half Cv square because Q is equal to Cv, right? So in this particular case, when the current has become maximum, capacitor has become fully discharged, the capacitor is saying, OK, fine, I don't, I'm discharged completely. I cannot do anything. But the inductor, according to Faraday's law and Lenz's law, wants to maintain a status quo. And it uses its magnetic energy to continue this current by inducing an EMF and inducing a current through it so that the current doesn't go to zero and it continues. And this continued current now charges the plates of the capacitor. Ultimately, it gets fully charged. At this point, the inductor gets used to it. It gives up, but the capacitor is now charged, so it continues. And so you can see that in half the cycle, we saw the current was flowing this way. The other half, the current was flowing this way. And this thing became completely charged. So this current is sinusoidal indeed. That means half the time it's one way, half the time it's another way. Half the time it's one way, half the time it's another way. So it's a sinusoidal current. Now we'll see mathematically how to get the same thing. If you're not convinced, by looking at what we described right now, you already should be able to say, I am pretty confident this current will be varying as sinusoidal current. It'll be either a sine function or a cosine function as a function of time. If you're not convinced, we'll right now do the math for it. But is the idea clear? Notice another thing that in the same cycle, in one full cycle that I'm showing you, the capacitor is fully charged twice. Right? The only difference is why won't we call this one cycle? Why is this only half a cycle? Because we haven't come back to exactly the same position. Here the capacitor is charged with opposite polarity. You know, it's like saying if a pendulum is swinging, I let the pendulum go from one extreme position. When it goes to this extreme position, is that one swing? No. It has to go from this extreme to this extreme and then come back to the same before we can say that, OK, it's exactly at the same position, right? The same thing is true here, but you can say that the pendulum has maximum magnitude displacement twice in one cycle, right? Because it go, starts from here, goes here, maximum, and then comes back. Same is true here. The polarity is different, so we cannot call that one cycle that's half the cycle. Is that making sense? Any questions? In fact, there is an exact analogy. This is one problem in which there is an exact analogy between there is an exact analogy between mass and spring system for simple harmonic motion that you have seen long time ago and capacitors and inductor. So a circuit with a capacitor and inductor. So let's discuss this in greater detail. So we are talking about LC oscillation. And I'll tell you this electrical mechanical analogy. And you know, even before we do any math, I want you to actually think about what are the things that are analogous. So let me put down, and I'll ask you to think, as opposed to me doing all the thinking. Uh, suppose I have mass spring system. And here we have LC oscillator. 
or LC circuit, let's just call it LC circuit. If you remember, in mass spring system, we used to talk about x, the position, you know, the displacement, and we used to talk about the velocity, right? You know what would be the analog of x here in the LC circuit? It will be the analog of x, the displacement here will be charge. Do you know what will be the analog of speed there? Can you make a guess? <coughs> you know, velocity was the display, uh, derivative of displacement with time was the velocity, right? What is the derivative of <coughs> charge with time? Current. So the analog of velocity in this case will be current in this case, right? Okay, here there were two things that were really important in determining the properties of the mass spring system. So this one, remember what we had, we had something like this. We had a spring and we had a mass attached to it. Spring had some spring constant k. Here we are talking about LC circuit. So we have a circuit which has L, we, has a, we have a circuit that has a capacitor, you know, maybe there's a certain amount of charge, there's certain current flowing, etc. So that's the LC circuit and I'm saying it's, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the LC circuit. Here inductor has some L inductance and it ha capacitor has some C capacitance. What do, you, do you remember something about M and K? M and K were very important parameters for the mass spring system. Mass is a measure of inertia, right? Larger is the mass of the system. Do you have to apply a greater force to change its state of motion? What is, what do you think will be the measure of mass, uh, sorry, analog, analog of mass for the, ma for the <coughs> LC circuit? What is the inertial element in an LC circuit? What tries to maintain a status quo? What doesn't want to change? Hmm? L. L. Do you remember L is the inductor, larger is the inductance of an inductor? You know, more is the tendency to maintain a status quo. It doesn't want to have the current in it change, it doesn't want to have it change. So the thing is the analog of M is L there and the analog K, now you can guess what it will be, it will be something related to C, right? Wouldn't it? Uh, and this thing turns out to be 1 over the capacitance. Okay, in this particular circuit, mass spring system, do you remember what was the angular frequency omega? Do you remember omega was square root of k divided by mass? Do you, do, do you remember that? Square root k over m? So then based upon that analogy, what should be omega here? Can anybody make a guess what omega should be here? Huh? Good. Omega in this circuit, you know, because omega is the angular frequency, right? Remember this? Omega is equal to 2 pi times f. What is f? f is period, 2 pi over t. F, f is 1 over period, do you remember that? So the thing is, and frequency f basically says how many cycles per second, how many times will this circuit oscillate per second? How many times the current will go like this every second, you know, full cycle? What should, do you think it should be? k, if k is 1 over c, let me write 1 over c, if m, is L, then let me write L. So it should be square root of LC, square root of 1 over LC. Isn't that true? Now how did we get all the, you know, how did we figure out, and do you remember what X was in this case? X in this case was X0 times cosine omega t plus phi, where phi was a phase, you know, depending upon what you start out with, right? Now. So it's like saying, oh, you could start a pendulum with the extreme position and call that time t equal to zero, or you could call time t equal to zero when it was at this position, or you could call time t equal to zero when it was here. You know, you can decide to call any time t equal to zero, it's up to you, and that will determine that phase phi. So if you remember, here you had x is equal to some x zero times cosine omega t. What about b? If this was x zero times cosine omega t, then this became? Sine omega t, some, some v zero times sine omega t. In other words, Velocity and, and displacement in a simple harmonic motion were always opposite of each other. Do you remember that? So that means when the mass, when you pull the mass and it went to the extreme position, 
at the extreme position is the displacement maximum? Yes, displacement from the unstretched position is maximum, but does the mass stop momentarily before it turns around? Doesn't it? Yeah, so its velocity becomes zero at that extreme position. So when the displacement is maximum, the velocity is zero. And then when the mass comes, 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 and now it's completely unstretched, does it stop there? No, it doesn't. In fact, the velocity is maximum when the displacement is zero. In fact, that's why this motion continues. If there was no air resistance this mo or friction, this motion will continue forever because the velocity and displacement are out of phase. When the displacement is maximum, think about a swing, which is just like mass spring system. When the swing is at the maximum displacement, velocity is momentarily zero, right? The swing turns around. Then the velocity increases, 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 increases. When it comes to the equilibrium position, it doesn't stop because the velocity at that moment becomes maximum when the displacement has become zero. If the velocity has become maximum, it continues, overshoots, goes to the other direction, and then as, as, as it overshoots, the velocity decreases, decreases, de decreases, the displacement from the equilibrium is increasing, and then when it goes to the extreme position, velocity has gone to zero, but the displacement has become maximum. Now again, at this point, you know, it goes down, 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 velocity keeps increasing at the equilibrium position, you know, at the position where the, there's no displacement, the velocity has become maximum, so they are out of phase. So what do you expect will happen to the charge and current? Should they be out of phase? That's exactly what we saw here. What we saw is that when the charge on the plates was maximum, the current was zero. When the current in the circuit was maximum, the charge was zero. They are totally out of phase. If one of them is a sine function, the other must be a cosine function. And it, is, it makes perfect sense. Doesn't it make the, uh, sense that uh, charge and current should be opposite, they sh if one of them is sine, the other is cosine. Why? Because dq over dt is the current, right? And if you take the derivative of sine, what does it, what do you get? A cosine. Or if you take a derivative of cosine, you get sine. So if the charge is a sine function or a cosine function, the current will be the opposite of that because it's dq over dt. Similarly, it makes sense that the velocity and displacement are out of phase in a simple harmonic motion because if this is sine, Velocity is, you know, dx over dt, it'll be cosine and vice versa. So it makes perfect sense. But let's do the math anyway. So conceptually, if all this makes sense, remember how we did the math for simple harmonic motion. I didn't teach you probably this course, but let's just review it anyway. So we started simple harmonic motion by saying that there's something called spring force, and spring force was equal to minus kx. So we said that if you pull this mass which is attached to a spring by some amount x, if this is the amount of compression or stretching from the unstretched position, then there's a restoring force which is f is equal to minus kx, k is the spring constant, right? From Newton's second law, f should be equal to ma, mass times acceleration, exactly. And so that will be this. But acceleration can be written as d square x over dt square, right? The second derivative of displacement with time is the acceleration. Isn't that true? So that should be equal to minus kx. All I'm, uh, all I'm saying is writing acceleration, which you can write as dv over dt, or d square x over dt square, like that. And this is a differential equation that we got, get. You know, this thing, another way to write this is, this is equal, this plus kx equal to zero. And if any of you have taken a differential equation course, you will remember that this is a very easy differential equation to solve. You know, this is just a second order differential equation, right? Ordinary, very easy to solve. And the solution is this. So solve this differential equation and the answer will be x is equal to x max times cosine omega t plus phi. And phi just depends upon what you want to call t equal to zero. This is called phase constant. And how do you find the V? V will be equal to dx over dt. And do you see if I take dx over dt, the derivative of cosine will be minus sine. And remember, if I take derivative of omega t, omega will get pulled out. So this will become omega times x max times sine omega t plus five, right? Okay, exactly in the same manner for our LC circuit that we are talking about, 
let us think about it. So, here is, bless you, here is my LC circuit. I have an inductor, I have a capacitor, right, this has inductance L, this is a, this has a capacitance C, right. Let us say that this has some positive charge here, let us, this has some negative charge. Do you remember that what is the potential difference across the capacitor V sub C? Should it be Q divided by C? What is the voltage across the inductor with inductance L? Do you remember the voltage across inductor V sub L is equal to minus L di over dt? How do I get that? That I get from Faraday's law because L times I was N times phi by definition. So if that is the case, if I use Kirchhoff's rule in this circuit and I say using Kirchhoff's rule, let us say that we go through the loop, you know, let us try one, one time going this way, A, B, C, D. If I go like this, it does not matter which way you go. If I go from A to B over a capacitor, I get what? minus Q over C, going from here to here, I am going from positive to negative, I go from here to here, <clears throat> I get what? minus L D I D T, nothing from here to here, I am black to the same point, this should be equal to 0. But you know what is L uh, uh, I? Can I write I? By the way, can I multiply throughout by negative sign? and get rid of negative sign. Yeah, I can always get rid of negative sign by multiplying throughout by negative sign. This becomes plus L D over DT. But you know, instead of I, I want to write it in terms of Q because we can only solve for one variable. And so why not convert either Q into I or I into Q? Q. It's easy to write I in terms of Q, DQ over DT, right? So instead of I, I'm going to write DQ over DT. That means it becomes D square Q DT square. And that should be equal to zero. Do you see that this equation is exactly like this equation here? Isn't it? You know, a, 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 an easier way to put this is let's divide by mass here. If you divide by mass, it becomes like this. Here, if I divide by L, I, it becomes like this. Look, isn't this looking exactly like this? This is the second derivative of Q with respect to time. This is the second derivative, sorry, this is second derivative of Q with respect to time. This is the second derivative of S, X with respect to time. This has X, this has Q. All the junk here left over, this constant left over is like K over M. Do you see? Compare this with that. Isn't 1 over LC exactly like K over M? And here we said that omega was square root of K over M. Shouldn't omega in this case be square root of 1 over LC? Just look at these equations. They are exactly the same differential equations. If you got these in differential equations class, you were, instead of k over m, you will be told constant c, constant c. Instead of, you know, 1 over lc, it will be just some constant you will be given. But you can see that they are exactly on the same footing. So what should be q? Should q be equal to some q max times cosine omega t plus phi? Here, omega will be equal to 1 over LC square root. Just like here, omega was equal to square root K over M. Also, the current here can be found by taking DQ over DT. And you can see here, it will be derivative cosine will be minus sign. Derivative of omega T will pull out the omega. So this will be minus omega Q max. sin omega t plus phi. So you can see that just like the mass spring system where you had like this, so this is for the mechanical system, the mass spring. And here now we are talking about the electrical system, LC. This is the mass spring. You know, if suppose you draw, draw x as a function of time and you draw it like this, this is your x is equal to x max cosine omega t plus phi, you know, then what will be your v as a function of time? Anybody wants to tell me what will be v as a function of time? Do you see that it is out of phase minus 
omega x max sin omega t. So, if we are starting with 0 this, this will first of all start with negative maximum and go like this. When this thing is 0 here, this thing should be, if this is maximum, this thing should be 0 maximum. When this is, uh, when this is maximum here, this thing should be 0, etc. Does that make sense? Here and the electrical, electrical analogy for our LC system should have Q as a function of time in the same way like this. This is Q max just like here this was X max, X max was this height here and in this case again if I plot Q as X current as a function of time it will be completely out of phase. So when the, when the charge here was 0, the current here will start out being negative maximum. Then when this goes to maximum, the current goes to 0. This goes to 0, the current goes to maximum here. This goes to maximum, the current goes to 0 here. This goes to 0, the current goes to negative maximum, etc. This is, I'm, I'm trying to plot these functions. I'm trying to plot this one. Q is equal to Q max cosine omega t plus phi and I is equal to minus omega Q max sine omega t plus phi. I have assumed that phi here is 0. So uh, what I'm trying to plot here is Q is equal to Q max cosine omega t. Here what I'm trying to plot is I is equal to minus omega Q max times sine omega t. That's what I'm plotting here. Do you see that these things are completely out of phase? That means when this one shows maximum displacement, this one goes through 0. When this one goes through maximum displacement, you know, like here, this thing is 0. My drawing is not the best, but this point goes with this. Okay? So they are out of phase. Is there any question, anybody? Okay, then the last thing that I want to talk about these systems is the energy stored in these systems. Again, let's do it with analogy. Anybody remembers what kinds of potential and kinetic energies there were in mass spring system? Tell me. So in the mechanical system, what was the potential energy? Is, wasn't there potential energies? If you, if you compressed or stretched the spring, if the, comp if the spring was compressed or stretched, it has energy is equal to half kx square. Do you remember half kx square was the energy stored in the spring, potential energy of the spring? So this was half kx square. What was the kinetic energy of the mass spring system? Just half mv square of the mass, right? If m is the mass, then half mv square was the kinetic energy of the mass, wasn't it? And so the total energy was half kx square plus half mv square. Is, is that making sense? What do you think it will be here? In the electrical case, we said that there are two kinds of energies. Energy stored in the inductor is half L I square and energy stored in the capacitor is half Q square over C. Do you remember that? You know, we can plug in the value of Q and I. We can always do that. So the thing is, You can always plug in the value of I and Q. So this can be in general written like this, half L and I is this, omega, omega square Q max square times sine square omega T plus phi. And here, this thing should be equal to half uh, Q square can be written like this, Q max square times cosine square omega t, Q max square times cosine square omega t divided by uh, C. This C is still there. Remember 2C, 2C. So one thing that you see is that the energy stored in the inductor and capacitor, are they out of phase? First of all, who wants to tell me what is L times omega square? Look at this thing. 
if omega tell me what is l times omega square can i write it in a slightly more neat looking manner tell me who wants to tell me how can i write it a little more neatly hmm Yeah, remember omega is equal to 1 square root of 1 over LC from here omega square is equal to 1 over LC in other words what you can see is L times omega square is equal to 1 over C isn't it so let's try to write these a little bit more neatly so what we find then is that I can write the energy stored in the inductor this is the magnetic energy stored in the inductor will be half half instead of l omega square i'm going to write 1 over c half times 1 over c times q max square times sin square omega t plus pi and then this thing the energy stored the electrical energy stored in the capacitor will be 1 over 2 c q max square cosine square omega t plus phi this is the electrical energy stored in capacitor right that's this thing 1 over 2 c q max square cosine square omega t and we should write here phi also plus phi okay so if we plot if we plot these energies what will they look like folks let's try to plot energy you know in this axis and here we are going to plot time who wants to tell me what will sin square omega t and cosine square omega t look like do you know what is the maximum value of sin or cosine one so sin square will never be more than one right the maximum value of sin square will be one the minimum value of sin square will be zero the maximum value of cosine square is 1 and the minimum value of cosine square is 0 so the thing is so you can see that what we are plotting there is going to look like this right let's say that this is the plot for use of l if this is the plot for use of l its ma minimum value will be 0 and its maximum value will be what Look, if the maximum value of sine is 1, the maximum value of use of L will be Q max square divided by 2C, wouldn't it? Okay, what about the other one, QC? When this one is going through 0, that one should be going through a 1. Do you see sine square and cosine square, are they always going to be out of phase? Yes, so when sine square is 1, cosine square should be 0. When cosine square is 1, sine square should be 0, etc. So this one will start with the maximum, go down. I should use chalks of different color, but you get the idea. So this curve is for UC. What about the total energy? Can I plot on the same plot the total energy? The total energy at any time, should it be like this? Is this the graph for total energy of LC, LC circuit? And that's basically what I was showing you here. If you look at this graph here, sorry, you know, I hope that you guys can see it. I'm not going to turn on the thing. Look at these purple and green things. You know, we start out with a case where the electrical energy is maximum. So for example, you know, like we may be at a situation where, <clears throat> where this thing starts out being maximum, right? And at that point, the magnetic energy is zero. So when this is maximum, this is zero. But at any point, even if I look here, if I add up this thing and this thing, this always adds up to the same thing. 
if if i look at the magnetic energy stored in inductor and electrical energy stored in capacitor the two things will always add up to the same value and that's what we are talking about do you see that this blue thing and green thing always add up to the same amount it's true that at some point you only have the magnetic energy at some point you only have the electric energy you know depending upon whether the capacitor is fully charged or the uncharged right but at the intermediate points you have some energy in the magnetic field stored in the inductor and elect and electric field stored in the capacitor and if you add these two things up it will always add up to the same value so the total energy of the system is constant of course in real life the demo that i showed you last time class do you remember the oscillations did damp out and that's because of the resistance in the circuit there is power dissipation i square times r because nothing is resistance less this is just like saying your mass spring system will never just keep oscillating you know with some amplitude all the time why because again there's damping we have not taken that into account right now is that making sense any questions folks anybody so then obviously now that we are this far the only thing that we have we have got left to do is to consider a real circuit because in all the electronic circuits that you really look at you have all these three things you have not just l not just c not just r you have r l and c all three things together so you should take into account the damping and let's do that now but before we take into account damping let me ask you a question let's solve a problem before we move on so suppose this is my example here is a example suppose the question is saying that if suppose at a certain time in lc circuit at uh, in lc circuit q is equal to q max over 2 okay the question is asking what fraction of energy total energy is stored in electric field of capacitor and what fraction is stored in the magnetic field of inductor i want you to take one minute talk to a person next to you about this question because you ought to be able to answer this question yourself so what if this is one of your exam question it says at a certain time in lc circuit the charge on the capacitor plate is q max over 2 so you know at some point in this lc circuit the charge on the plates of the capacitor has become q over 2 the question is asking of the total energy in the system what fraction at that moment is in electrical energy and what fraction is in magnetic energy stored in the inductor does that make sense because we know that the two should add up to the maximum value all the time this circuit has no damping there's no resistance talk to a person next to you you do it yourself then i'll help you somebody from the second row anybody from the second row folks somebody from the second row anybody wants to help me go ahead anybody it's a friendly class come on folks any thoughts okay how much is the total energy tell me first the total energy so what is the u total if i have already told you that q q is max is the maximum charge can you tell me the total you total 
will it be half this is this is this is this isn't this the if if q max is the total charge because you can see that there is a point here you know you can see here there is a point when there's no current i don't need to worry about magnetic energy magnetic energy is zero the only the capacitor is charged and if this is the maximum charge q max all the energy is in capacitor that's q max square over 2c you know that's in some sense if you like that's this point here in this graph total energy is only in the capacitor inductor has zero energy right <coughs> or any point any other point you know you can see any other point will be the same right because at this point if the capacitor has certain energy the inductor will have certain other energy such that if i add it it gives me the same total if i add this and this it, i get the same same total right is is this making sense that this is the total energy i can use the q max to figure out what the total energy is so now we have been given what is the uc the energy stored in the capacitor if it has a maximum charge q max over 2 shouldn't it be this 2c times q square right at time t at the time given in the problem isn't this true and so what is q that is given we are given that q is equal to q max divided by 2 if that's the case this will be q max over 2 square divided by 2c what this means this is one fourth of the q max square over 2c isn't it so what is it is it one fourth of the total isn't it so do i even need to do the second part or is it obvious what the other one will be the inductor will be three fourth of the total wouldn't it since this is one fourth of the total, we know already the en energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor will be three fourth of the total. So basically, what we are saying is that if this one has say, you know, if this is one one fourth of the total, then <clears throat> at this time, you know, this is some time t is equal to t one. At this time, if we are saying that the electrical energy is one fourth then this this point the magnetic energy must be three fourths such that if i add this number with this number it adds up to this total thing is that making sense because the two things should add up to the total energy of the system because in an lc circuit there is no damping there's no resistance no energy is lost the total energy is always constant as you can see all these blue things and and purple things that are showing you the magnetic energy in an inductor on an electrical energy in the capacitor add up to the same value all the time. It's true, at one point all the energy was in the capacitor and you can easily find what would be the total energy by saying, oh, when the, all the energy was in capacitor, it had Q is equal to Q max, so the total energy would be Q max square over 2C and then use that and figure out what should be the what fraction of energy is in the capacitor at some point when the charge has gone to q max over 2 any questions folks about this okay then let's move on to our lc circuit and you will see that we won't have to do very much work at all because all we have to do is we have to put a resistor in the circuit so this is my r this is my l this is my C and the thing is in this case you know let's say that we have a current flowing like this in the circuit what are we going to uh, what do we have then let's try to go uh, over the circuit what we will end up with is that the voltage across the capacitor V sub C will be Q over C the voltage across the inductor will be minus L di over dt, the voltage drop across the resistor will be I, I times R because of uh, Ohm's law, V is equal to I R and these things should add up to zero, right? And so basically what we have, and again, I can write everything in terms of uh, 
I can write I into as dq over dt. So this thing di over dt becomes dq square d square q dt square plus I r can be written as dq over dt times r. All I did was I wrote I is equal to dq over dt. di over dt becomes the second derivative with, of q with respect to time. This is a circuit please. Absolutely. Yeah, so UL, if you found UL, you will still get, you know, uh, the same answer as what we got right now. But since you are given the maximum <coughs> charge, you are given everything in terms of maximum charge, it's easy to find what is uh, the total energy stored in terms of Q. Suppose I change the question. Suppose I gave you, the, I gave you, let, let me, I mean, you have to think about which one is the most, I mean, which way you have the most convenient way of figuring out how much is the total energy stored in the system. So I could give you a different exam question in which I could say, for example, you know, <coughs> the maximum, you know, in an LC circuit, maximum current, um, no, the current at some moment, at some instant is say I max over 2, find the fraction of energy in inductor and stored in inductor and capacitor. So if this was your question, what would be the easiest way to figure out what is the total, what is the total energy? Tell me, no, you, you tell me, tell, tell me the answer. What would be the easiest way to figure out what is the total energy here? If I gave you the question in terms of I max, what is the easiest way to figure out what is the total energy of the system? Wouldn't you use, I mean, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't it be easiest for us to actually exploit the case when the current was maximum here because that, that would be, that is the case when all the energy is in the magnetic field of the inductor, right? If I'm given things in terms of I max, the easiest, I can avoid all my work if I first figure out how much is the total energy in terms of I max, right? And I max would mean that that's the time when all the energy is stored in the inductor, isn't it? So can anybody tell me, anybody, because all of you should be able to answer this, you know, if you, what is the total energy stored in this thing? In terms of I max, can you tell me? Shouldn't it be this, just half L I max square, shouldn't this be the total energy? Because, you know, we know that if we are, we are given things in terms of the current, maximum current, there is a time in the circuit when the current is maximum, at that time, all of the energy is in inductor, and the energy in the inductor is just half Li square. So when the current is maximum, it's half Li square. And I know that if at one instant, and that's this time, that's the time when the, <clears throat> look, at this time, the inductor has all the energy, capacitor doesn't. So the good thing about using things as I max here is that then everything else can be found in terms of I max. So now, can you easily figure out what is the energy stored in the inductor at the instant given? This is the total, right? Tell me what is, what is the energy stored in the inductor at the instant given? Whoever asked the question. So tell me in terms of I max over 2, we are told that at some given time, you know the current is I max over 2. Let's say, you know, over here, maybe some, some time at some point, the current is I max over 2. So tell me, can we figure out the, at that time, what is the energy stored in the inductor? Very good. It should be half L I square, which is half L times I max over 2 square, right? Shouldn't it? Isn't it? So this and this thing, if you see, is one fourth of half L I max square, which means, which means this is one fourth of U total. 
So you can see that I already have simplified my life by saying if you gave me the question in terms of I max, I found the total, en total energy in terms of I max and then I said, oh, the energy in stored in the inductor will be one fourth of U total. That means the energy stored in the capacitor will be three fourths of the total. Uh, of the u total i mean whatever is easiest for you you know because if you're given question in terms of i max oh, then you should well. shouldn't you because shouldn't, don't you think that that makes things easier because if, if i'm given things in terms of i max i can find the maximum current in terms of how much is the maximum energy stored in the inductor and then the rest of the thing i can find in terms of that because i know that the total energy is not changing does that make sense, please? Okay, this is the formula for the. For, uh, do you agree that when the current is I max, is there any charge on the capacitor when the current is I max? There isn't. So, is there any any energy stored in the capacitor? There isn't, right? If there's no charge, so when the current is I max, I know that all of the energy is due to the current, which means it's due to the energy stored in the magnetic field that is produced by the current in the inductor. And so I know that that time the energy, and remember energy stored in any inductor was half Li square. So at the moment the current is maximum, I know that all of the energy stored in the inductor and the energy is half L I max square. But hey, that's also the total energy in the system because when I is equal to I max, there's no energy stored in the electric field of the capacitor. So once I have found the total, then I can find the energy stored just in the inductor by saying, oh, if you told me the current at some instant is I max over 8, then I'll say, oh, at that instant, the energy stored in the inductor would be half L I max over 8 whole square, right? That will be 1 over 64th of the energy that is maximum, maximum. And so the energy stored in the capacitor then must be 63 over 64th of the maximum. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's basically the idea. Whatever is more convenient for you, use that. Is that making sense, Paroma? Is that your name? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No, I roughly knew, but I didn't know exactly what it was. All right, so is there any question, folks? All right. So let's move on then to talking about RLC circuit. So this, does everybody see here? I know, I already know what is, you have told me what is the capacitance, what is the inductance, what is the resistance in the circuit. The, what, what I'm solving for is Q as a function of time. So solve this differential equation. And what you will find is this complicated looking thing. It will tell you that Q is equal to Q max times e to the power minus R T over 2 L times uh, cosine omega prime T plus phi is this one, R over 2 L square. Notice something that is very interesting. Is this just a sinusoidal function? No, in order to do the sinusoidal thing, you have this exponential damping. Do you see that there is an, ex uh, by the way, frequency has gotten modified. The frequency is no longer omega, but it is omega square minus r over 2L whole square. Okay, so, so the frequency has changed. But if I plot Q as a function of time, what will it look like? Does anybody want to help me with Q as a function of time? And tell me what it looks like, please. Excellent. What you will see is that it will start out with some amplitude and then it will start to damp out. You know, so you will see this envelope, you know, this exponential fall off here. You know, there's a fall off exponentially here. In addition to this sinusoidal, so this sinusoidal behavior that you are seeing is due to this cosine omega prime t plus phi. But in addition to that, you have this e to the power minus rt over 2l, and that is damping the whole thing out. Does it make sense? Now, if I ask you this thing, in which case will the system get damped out very quickly? 
what should be large in the system and what should be small in the system for this you know these oscillations to die out really fast what would you say one thing is obvious the resistance should be high, high. if there is high resistance do you see that e to the power minus rt over 2l will be high the damping will be fast what about inductance it seems to depend upon inductance also right how when will you when the will the system damp really fast when the inductance is low do you see because inductance here is in the denominator when l is small this whole thing will be large right and the damping this thing will damp out much faster so the thing is the damping depends upon r and l if r is large resistance in the circuit is large you will see these oscillations will die out fast if the inductance is low you will see these oscillations will die out fast does that make sense folks have a wonderful day and don't hesitate to stop by you know if you need any help because now is the time to get help don't wait till the last day have a great weekend professor singh is a lecturer in the physics department at the university of pittsburgh for more information about professor singh and her research visit her website in the description below